Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ben Tomczyk on behalf of the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. Thank you so much for joining us for today's program, Fiscal Solutions to Climate Change. Before we begin, uh, a couple of housekeeping announcements. The first is we are recording this program for future use. We'll also be sending it out to everybody afterwards uh, later on this week. Additionally, we are streaming the event on Facebook and live tweeting it on Twitter. If you wanna get involved in the online conversation, you can do so on Twitter by following us using the handle at BudgetHawks. Furthermore, we wanna make today's event as conversational as possible. So we encourage you to please submit your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. If you wanna direct your questions to a panelist, please make sure to note that as well. Okay, as I said, we have a really great program for you today, uh, broken up into two sections. Uh, but kind of the framing around the issue is the fact that the United States is facing a number of generational challenges, including high and rising national debt and the increasing effects of climate change. So we wanted to have a conversation to look at kind of what are the fiscal solutions to climate change? What would those entail? And what's currently being discussed policy-wise with policymakers? So to help kick off this conversation, committee president Maya McGinnis had the chance earlier to sit down with Senator Sheldon Whitehouse of Rhode Island. And here now is their conversation. Senator Whitehouse, thanks so much for joining us um, for our Fiscal Solutions and Climate Change event today. You are the perfect guest to have with us. Um, you're certainly really familiar to our, our audience, but I'm gonna just give you a mini intro nonetheless. So for everybody's knowledge, Senator Whitehouse has been a champion on Capitol Hill for many years for many important issues, including climate, healthcare, dark money in politics, and one near and dear to my heart, budget process reform. We have a longstanding relationship with him. We've worked closely with him on a variety of these issues. And importantly, he, like the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, is um, committed to working on these things in a bipartisan way when able to, because that is how you get a lot of these policies done. Um, directly related to our program today, Senator Whitehouse is the sponsor of the Save Our Future Act, a bill that would implement a carbon dioxide pricing regimen. So we were going we're to talk about that and plenty of things today. Um, welcome to you. Thanks for joining us for this event. Great to be with you, Maya. We're we're a couple of real nerds who get excited about budget process reform, huh? No, I know. That's why, that's why the people who are watching us today are the few people who probably share the absolute excitement. Like, it's fun. It's really interesting. And we're going to get something done. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, let me get us started on climate issues. So let's talk about carbon emissions. Um, they have fallen nearly 20% since 2005. Great news. Can you go ahead and talk a bit about why you think we need a legisl need legislative solutions to address climate change as well? Uh, well, first of all, um, you know, emissions year over year might have fallen, but our carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere, which is the real measure, continues to climb. It just broke another record in the last measurement, and we anticipate it's only going to go higher unless there's some really significant um, interventions. Uh, the other wrinkle is that a good deal of those carbon emissions were saved by transitioning from coal to uh, natural gas, and it omits the methane emissions, which spike dramatically when you move from coal to natural gas because leakage is such a problem in the natural gas industry. So it's not clear that we're actually gaining that much in overall greenhouse gas emissions reduction. Uh, but what is clear is that we're not gaining ground on emission, greenhouse gas emissions concentrations in the atmosphere. And that's the test. Um, so we got a lot of work to do ahead of us to actually turn that corner and start driving the emissions numbers and the concentration number down to safe levels proving that you are a nerd in lots of topics, not just budget process. Um, yeah, you can so- trust me for a nerd answer every time. <laughs> um, right, so we still have huge problems that are out there. Um, the urgency of this should, should not be understated. 
Um, and the question is how we want to approach it, what things are going to be the most workable. So last year, you put forward legislation to enact a carbon tax, um, something that I uh, think is a really important policy for us to be pursuing with so many different advantages. For those who are unfamiliar with it, can you explain a little bit about what a carbon tax is? Let's just start with the basics. Sure. What is a carbon um, tax? Why do you favor basic, that approach? We call it a carbon fee because it's more in the nature of a penalty. It's not gotcha. necessarily a tax to raise revenues, uh, although it does raise revenues and we can decide what to do with them uh, separately. But the focus of this is not as a revenue raiser, it is as a economic signal. And at the moment, it being free to emit carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, there's very little economic constraint on doing so. And equally dangerous, there's very little revenue proposition to support anybody who wanted to innovate their way into solutions for reducing carbon emissions. And that combination of lost innovation and um, encouraged pollution is one of the reasons that we're still losing ground in atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations, still losing ground in uh, warming ocean temperatures, still losing ground in ocean acidification rates across the board. Can you talk a little bit about the specifics of the bill? Sure. Um, well, we actually, let me talk about, about uh, two. The bill that we filed, uh, was with me, Senator Schott, Senator Heinrich, Senator Gillibrand, um, and there may have been a few others who got added along the way. Mm -hmm. But initially, it has been sort of steadily my bill with Senator Schott and Senator Heinrich. Um, it would raise about $2 trillion. It, caused, it charges a fee on carbon emissions per ton of carbon emissions, and it charges it at the point of either extraction or importation. So it's really simple to apply just in terms of the mechanics of applying the, the fee. Um, and it has an offset, a carbon border adjustment for um, trade so that a cement factory in Texas is not put out of business by a cement factory in Mexico, simply because the cement factory in Mexico cheats on carbon emissions. So that's the general framework. We then went to work uh, from that general framework, first with the Biden White House, and then with the House to make sure that if we passed it, they'd be ready and willing to support it. And in the course of those negotiations, um, the measure changed a bit, but roughly stated, it kicks in at about $15 per ton of carbon dioxide emissions or equivalent in other greenhouse gases. And then it rises pretty gradually for uh, four, five, six years. And then it accelerates a bit more so that industry has a good solid signal of what's coming before uh, they get hit with the uh, stronger uh, prices. We exclude unleaded gasoline and home heating oil. Um, and it raises about uh, maybe seven to nine hundred billion dollars seems to be the range over a 10 year period. And it would dramatically, dramatically reduce emissions. If you look at the um, originally proposed clean electricity standard that the Biden administration proposed, and if you look at all the climate tax measures that the Finance Committee passed, uh, it blows the doors off of each of them. And in fact, it blows the doors off the two of them summed together in terms of emissions reductions that are estimated to follow. And we worked very hard to try to get good numbers on that. We worked with really four different analysis groups to check and cross check all their work and make sure we weren't being you know, led astray by some anomaly in one firm's calculations. So that's... Um... That's really encouraging. What is the response of business and industry? How are the players who would be involved affected? Because um, my sense is there's actually more support than people might be aware of. But can you give us the kind of inside take on the people who might be nervous about this, how they have responded? Yeah, well, 
you know, nominally there's a fair amount of support. Groups like the Business Roundtable and the Climate Leadership Council, even the American Petroleum Institute have spoken positively about putting a price on carbon emissions. And that's a newer position for the Petroleum Institute, isn't it? Yeah, that's new in about the last year. Yeah. Um, but they haven't actually gotten behind a bill yet. Okay. So their support for something remains out kind of in hypotheticals land and hasn't actually come into focus to push for any particular piece of legislation. So I would say at this point, the support is mostly nominal from those groups. There's also another group of businesses whose support is a little bit more tangible in that they put a price on carbon internally within their own business on investment decisions that the company makes. And if you're a big company spending hundreds of billions of dollars, then this can be a very impactful thing. So it's proven that it works in that business environment. So that's another sort of leg under the stool. And then of course we have the um, social cost of carbon, which has been kicking around for a while now Unfortunately, the Biden administration can't get its updated one out of its own Office of Management and Budget yet, mm -hmm. but um, there was one developed under the uh, Obama administration, and that basically is the same thing as a price on carbon, although you'd factor it into regulatory decisions rather than into business decisions. So those are some of the ways in which this analysis is already proceeding. You also will have seen in the Wall Street Journal that massive uh, editorial. I think it's signed by something like 17 Nobel Prize winning economists and thousands of other economists that pricing carbon is the most effective and consequential way to do something about the climate emergency. Um, given how impactful the output of this would be, the structure that you've come up with, um, do you think that that a price on carbon will in its own reduce emissions enough, given what, what we know about what we have to achieve? Or are there other policies that we're also going to have to enact? Well, I think we're probably going to have to throw everything we have at this problem until we're really sure that we're safe. Um, this is a problem that has at least a tipping point in it. It may have a whole series of cascading tipping points. But the image that I always have in mind is a boat. And as the boat sinks lower and lower in the water, you see the sea coming up the sides of the hull and not much changes as the sea creeps up the side of the hull until the moment comes that it tops the gunnels of the boat and floods into the boat. And all of a sudden you have a catastrophic situation and the boat goes down. And that's what we need to head off. And until we're comfortable that we have that headed off, I think, um, that makes the carbon price a necessary, but not sufficient part of the climate solution. I think you necessarily fail without one. But right. I think that in addition to having one, there's a lot else you have to do. And some of that is you know, investments in nuclear, investments in carbon capture, investments in uh, green technology, clearing the way for transmission of solar and wind. There's a whole portfolio of things that we could be doing. It's interesting, I think about this a lot, that the whole challenge of climate is very similar to the challenge of fiscal policy in that while the problem is getting worse and worse, while that boat is sinking, you don't actually see the effects. They are out there in ways that you don't see. And maybe maybe in climate, you know, you're starting to see them, but you can't prove the links. And it's a gradual, the toad, the frog in the boiling water scenario, right? Where yeah. it's just going a little bit, a little bit. And there's and on the no boat, the stewards are still serving dessert in the dining room as if nothing yeah. was going on. Exactly. Meantime, the water's and those people up who the are side warning, of the hall. Those people who are warning know that you can get to a point where it's too late. You don't know where that is. You don't know when it will hit you, but you know it can happen. And that every minute you wait, it's not linear. It's exponential how much more you'll have to do to address it. Yes. But that bumps up against the political environment where it's really hard to do anything particularly hard things, unless there is an action, action forcing moment. So I yeah. always see these two issues as incredibly parallel in the challenges that they have, both in their now, importance and the challenges. We have a potential action forcing moment coming up as the European Union develops and imposes its carbon border adjustment mecha mechanism, what they call by the acronym, the CBAM. And I encourage 
everybody in the EU to impose the CBAM on us and not brook any delay, any cavil, any exemption, any waiver, um, make sure that our feet get held to the fire on the CBAM, because that could be the thing that causes us to also apply a carbon border adjustment to offset the tariffs that we pay. And now you've got the EU and the United States in a common place mm -hmm. with a carbon price implicit in the carbon border adjustment mechanism. And that sends an incredibly powerful signal to the rest of the world economy, particularly to China and India, who are respectively three times more carbon inefficient and four times more carbon inefficient than we are in the US. So when we're tariffing the hell out of their products, suddenly they'll get serious about catching up to us. And without that kind of a signal, I think it's really hard to drive behavior in China and India. So the EU CBAM leads to a US response that then creates a platform that drives uh, China and India to catch up rapidly. And suddenly that pathway to safety begins to look a lot clearer. Okay, I did not know about this. That is exactly the kind of action forcing moment that provides a huge opportunity. Do we know what the timeline is? Yeah, it's gonna start kicking in, in in 2023 and it will be fully implemented in 2026. Okay, so things are about to start happening then. That's yeah. that's yeah. Cool. okay. And um, interestingly, there's quite a lot of bipartisan interest in carbon border adjustment in the Senate right now. There's a lot of conversation happening um, and it's quite bipartisan. And Senator Manchin, who sort of straddles the middle on these issues, um, has also expressed a lot of interest in carbon border adjustment. So it's a it's a ripe area and it allows people to move uh, into a market mechanism that in effect prices carbon without perhaps having to vote specifically on a carbon price or as oh, the enemy carbon tax. I was just going to ask you why that has the appeal, but it's pretty clear that it does because it's able to circumvent or skirt around the issues that might be an appealing to a lot of, of Republicans or conservatives who otherwise actually think that these policies would be really effective, uh, yeah. which there are many folks out there who do, I know from my own conversations. And it actually could be a considerable win for the US economy, because if you look at it bilaterally, yes, the US will be paying tariffs because the EU is more efficient than we are. And so that's a bad thing for uh, US companies who have to pay the tariffs, but it's not just bilateral, it's against the world. And when you factor in the much larger tariffs that the Chinese are gonna have to pay with their three times greater carbon inefficiency and that the Indians are gonna have to pay with their four times greater carbon inefficiency, the case that those tariffs will actually drive manufacturing to the more efficient United States is pretty strong. So we could actually end up economic winners in the deal. And then of course, as I said before, from a climate perspective, to put that kind of economic pressure on China is going to be essential to getting ourselves on a pathway to safety. And some of this is where I have heard the interest, excitement, optimism from businesses because they believe that they will actually be able to compete um, and because of their internal abilities to adapt to this more than many of the people in their industries globally, they feel confident. And that's why I have sort of felt a big uptick, uptick in business support on this area. Yeah, businesses and industries um, have taken a look at this and some of them have realized that they are likely winners under this yeah. and have begun to advocate for it. Uh, again, it's small and occasional advocacy I don't want anybody overlooked that the vast weight of the corporate business presence in Congress is fully against any serious climate legislation. Most of the major trade associations don't lift a finger on climate. They don't mention it. They're AWOL. Um, some of the very big business associations like the Chamber of Commerce and the National Association of Manufacturers are outright hostile to climate legislation. And of course, the fossil fuel industry has its whole array, its whole archipelago of phony front groups that it's built up over the years with the specific purpose of blockading mm -hmm. climate legislation. So if you're a Republican looking around for corporate support for climate legislation, you're going to have to look long and hard before you find any. And if you're looking among the trade associations, good luck. <laughs>
Okay, but and I'm not known to be an optimist because there's so often not things to be optimistic about, but I feel it's shifting in the other direction. I feel small and there might be baby steps, but I feel some movement. And I really have had conversations, as you've had yeah. many more than I have, with business leaders who say, actually, this is a this is a situation that we will be able to compete in, and all we want to do is compete in a way that's going to improve the overall uh climate situation and economy. So the bellwethers will be when the American Bankers Association decides to get serious about this, given all the threats that have been so widely reported by banks to the economy from climate. When the realtors start to get serious about this, after all the threats that have been reported about coastal property value crashes because of uh, climate, when the insurance industry puts this into its uh, legislative priorities, um, which they have not done despite having to write these huge checks for wildfires, floods, hurricanes, mm -hmm. and at all, um, and of course, when the chamber and the National Association of Manufacturers come in off the uh, ledge and stop being enemies of progress. Well, you just laid out a great strategy for those who are doing the coalition building in this area um, in terms of some of those those associations. That's really interesting and I think would yeah. be effective. OK, let me pivot. The members have already taken the position that we would like to see the trade associations take. So it's weird because you have publicly stated policies by major corporations that don't conform with the policies that are being pursued by their own trade associations. And that's something that they ought to clean up. Yeah, we've seen this in fiscal policy a lot where you have differences of opinions within the association. So the association doesn't do much of anything. But I've also seen that that's how the change comes about, where there's a tipping point when enough of the yeah. members start to move and that puts pressure on the others. The associations are more cautious than the individual companies often, I think. Yeah, let me time. Let me pivot to fiscal policy, which is sort of the what we're related. We're trying to think about climate in the realm of fiscal policy. Yeah, I think you already alluded to this when you started the conversation. But so with the carbon, the carbon fee, there is revenue that comes from it. An awful lot of it is actually one of the places where there are significant chunks, chunks of revenue, which makes anything easier in some ways because you have different options for what you do with that. So you can use it to pay for new climate spending. Um, you can use it for uh, carbon dividends, which is an idea that's gained a lot of popularity in past years. You can use the money to help address some of the fiscal challenges we have in the country. What do you think about, if you think about it, when you think about where you put the money, or do you think it doesn't matter, the purpose is climate, and then let's figure out what the revenue usage needs to be in order to gain the support? How do you think about that other side of the equation? Well, I come at it from a couple of principles. The first is that we ought to make sure that the net economic effect is economically progressive. And given the uh, regressivity of our uh, economy right now and the extent to which the rich get richer and the poor keep struggling and losing ground, making it dramatically more progressive, I think would be a very good thing. Um, while we're dealing with climate issues, I think helping the environmental justice community get its due at long last and coping with the labor force that is going to have to transition um, are two other very important purposes. Um, but as a general proposition, I'm trying to focus as much as I can on making sure that the emissions reductions are there from it. And um, I'm amenable to working with my entire caucus and any Republicans who are interested in coming up with whatever spending makes this work so we can get it passed politically. If the boat sinks while we're quarreling over how to spend the money, yeah. a very stupid tactical decision. Um, but in that conversation, I'd be focusing on progressivity, environmental justice, and transition. Got it. Thank you. Um, we are in a unique moment, not unique, but uh, a moment we haven't been in in 40 years in terms of the economy and inflation. Can you talk a little bit about how you think about the carbon tax and its relationship to inflation or energy costs? Yeah, um, I think we have really two separate things going on. We've got this weird anomaly in the energy market where oil and gas prices are not set by traditional market yeah. principles. The person who's you know pumping oil or gas out of their fields in Texas has costs that are associated with bringing that product to market. And ordinarily, 
that cost would drive the price of the product. But that's not what happens. Instead, what happens is that an international, an international cartel controls the price of oil and gas and um, a bunch of speculators surrounding that cartel can rev it up or cool it down. And of course, Putin's raid into Ukraine and the change to the supply from Russia's fields being shut off has both powered up the cartel so that by refusing to pump, they can drive prices up and it's spooked speculators who've played around the fringes of that market and driven the international cartel price up even further. So the result of that is these American big oil companies who have this wonderful situation of their costs haven't changed hardly at all, but the price they get to charge because of this cartel have, has gone through the roof. So they're making record profits and paying record salaries and bonuses and compensation to their CEOs. So everybody in oil and gas land is, is happy as a clam at the situation, but people are getting clobbered at the pump. Unfortunately, they've got a really good propaganda uh, effort to try to put this at Joe Biden's feet and blame him for it. Um, considering that they're the parties who actually set the price, I think that's a little bit rich. And if you actually let Biden set the price, now that he's being blamed for it, he could knock at least a dollar off that price easily, leaving the companies highly profitable still. Um, but of course, they don't want that. They want to blame him, but they don't want to lose control over the pricing of their product. Uh, this, this, uh, listening to you talk about that, I just find the entire pricing uh, in the energy markets one of the most fascinating fascinating economic topics there is. I don't know enough about it. I'm not going to put you on the spot, but anyone in the audience who has read like something phenomenal that explains it, could you please send me what I should read? I keep telling my son who's headed off to college, this should be his first essay in economics. It's so fascinating how this market works. Um, we just have two, sorry? Or doesn't since it's- Or doesn't, or fails to work. I'm really, I, I need to read much more on it. Um, two last quick topics. One, let's talk about the political outlook. How do you think this is going to play out? Could it be part of the reconciliation package? Is it going to take a longer time? We talked a little bit about there is bipartisan support, but it's complicated. Where do you see this, this coming in the next months and years? I'm still focused on the reconciliation bill. That expires on September 30th. We probably really lose our ability to do it when we leave for the August recess. So I think effectively we have until August to try to land this plane um, and make sure that everybody who's participating in these conversations is serious and sincere and see what we can do. I do think that the bipartisan conversations about the carbon border adjustment are reassuring mm -hmm. to some of our more conservative members in the caucus that putting this into the reconciliation bill is actually not such a bad or dangerous thing. So I think the conversations happening, uh, the bipartisan conversations are not necessarily unhelpful to getting what we need to do done by when we uh, head off in August. That makes sense. I think that too, I think they are very productive and that it's, it's gonna show, it's gonna create more comfort, whatever the timeline ends exactly. up being. Um, okay, final question for you. Um, I do run the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget. We do face an unsustainable fiscal path. What do you, when you're thinking more broadly about the nation's fiscal outlook, are there steps in particular you think we should be focusing on to help tackle these issues? Well, depending on the, whether we go with uh, White House Carbon Price Plan A or White House, White House uh, Carbon Price Plan B, you're somewhere between two trillion yeah. and maybe $800 billion in revenues. And some of that I think can be used to deal with fiscal issues. Um, and I think there'll be some appetite for that in the conversation. Uh, I think largely as you and I have said before, we've got to fix the process in the budget committee. So we're dealing with real issues, real numbers and the reality of all the arithmetic of what it takes to run the deficit being in the equation and the target being a sustainable debt to GDP ratio. Um, and if we can frame that out, then I think the conversation becomes much more conducive to rational solutions rather than people just yelling at each other and not paying attention to the budget process because everybody knows it's an inherent failure because it's only looking at appropriated dollars and that's only a slice of the problem. 
Yeah, I am. I am optimistic about the great budget process work you have done and will continue to do. And I think I think we're going to make headway because nobody looks at our budget and says, "Boy, this this is working well." Let's not let's not change a thing. So, yeah. um, Senator Whitehouse, thank you so much. Really glad you're able to join the event for us, um, and it was great talking with you. Great to be with you, and thank you for your wonderful work. You guys are a really important organization to work with and do a great job here. Thank you. Appreciate that. Take care. Take care. Okay, I'm going to ask uh, if our panelists will turn their cameras and mics on. And as they do, just want to say a special thank you to Senator Whitehouse for joining us earlier and to his team for helping to arrange that uh, conversation between him and Maya. We have a great panel here. I'm going to go round robin left to right according to how they are on my Zoom Brady Bunch screen. We have Katrina Rourke, who is Senior Vice President for Policy and Research at the Climate Leadership Council and Executive Director of the Center for Climate and Trade. We have John Huntley, who is a Senior Economist at the Penn Wharton Budget Model. And of course, we have my colleague, Mark Goldwine, who is Senior Vice President and Senior Policy Director at the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. Uh, I want to dive deeper into some of these topics, fiscal policy, carbon pricing, BBB, or excuse me, Build Back Better. Uh, but before we do, I want to do a quick round robin. Uh, we just heard from Senator Whitehouse, so I'm curious uh, from each of you, what was a, a takeaway or, or something that, that surprised you? Who, who wants to go first? I'll start, Ben. Um, it was really nice to hear the Senator invoke two um, interesting trends Today we're talking about um, fiscal policies to address climate change related to our sort of domestic priorities. He brought up this linkage to international trade, the European Union enacting or proposing their carbon border adjustment mechanism, this notion of the US carbon advantage and our ability to sort of outcompete international rivals because our economy is already much more carbon efficient. Um, these, these data points and these trends allow us to consider um, how we might better leverage market solutions to climate change, not just domestically, but also impacting the global economy to build bridges and be more effective, not just at reducing U.S. emissions, um, which as the Senator noted, are reducing year over year, but to bend the curve globally and start pulling, uh, pulling down emissions so that we can successfully address the climate challenge with international partners. So really nice to hear him invoke this this link towards our international partners. So uh, I'll uh, go next here. Um, I thought what he said was very interesting uh, and particularly what Kat, uh, Katrina noted was the international dimension, uh, which sort of feeds into the one thing that I think we need to have a, a few more discussions on is uh, distributional effects. Uh, you know, obviously the Senator mentioned a lot of, um, you know, a lot of the distributional effects among businesses, you know, being mindful of how certain carbon taxes could affect uh, you know, a Texas concrete factory relative to their competitors abroad. But, uh, the, you know, the, the cost of these policies is not borne uh, evenly across, you know, individual residents in the, in the United States. Some people, particularly those who consume a lot of goods, particularly the carbon intensive goods in China, are going to hurt a lot more than other people, particularly wealthier people, uh, you know, who, who, uh, who save a lot more money. So there are significant distributional concerns um, with these policies. Again, it's nothing that can't be addressed. Um, but, uh, but it's something that I think uh, we're going to need to talk about in order to bring a, a wider swath of the community on board with these sorts of proposals. And so I was very interested in sort of the sinking boat metaphor and the idea that um, we need to treat this a little bit differently than a sort of your standard cost benefit analysis as long as there's that tipping point for it. So Senator Whitehouse basically said, we need to throw everything at this now, nuclear, um, you know, taxes, investment, uh, carbon, carbon sequester. And then once we understand we're in the clear, then we can kind of stay, take a step back and do a more traditional cost benefit analysis. That's a very interesting way of thinking about this. Well, I, I want to dive a, a little bit deeper. And John, I want to start with you. Um, you recently released an analysis of the uh, $550 billion in climate related provisions uh, in Build Back Better. And so I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about uh, those policies and, and what you found. Uh, absolutely. Uh, it's my pleasure to, to share our research with you, and I really appreciate the opportunity that uh, you and, and Mark and, and Maya have given me here. Um, so what we did is we took a close look at all the 50, $550 billion uh, of provisions uh, related to climate change in Build Back Better. 
Uh, and we matched each proposal in the BBB to sort of the best available economic research uh, available to determine sort of the amount of carbon abated um, that we could expect from those. Uh, and what we find is that there's a huge amount of variation in these provisions effectiveness. Uh, provisions uh, focused on natural resource development and conservation tend to have a, a higher cost effectiveness when abating carbon. And the programs like those that are paid to retrofit buildings um, with energy efficiency improvements tend to have some of the lower ones. Uh, so we take all of this carbon abatement across all the provisions and we count up the benefits associated with that. Uh, we take those benefits and the costs and feed them into our dynamic model so that we can learn a little something about our economy, about you know, taxes, government debt, wages, and, and all the other stuff that people care about. And when we do that, uh, we find that the programs that are financed with non-distortionary fees uh, tend to lead to small increase in GDP, re uh, reflecting the, the value in these programs, the services coming from these programs. Um, but by contrast, when these programs are financed with additional deficits, the negative economic effects uh, from the higher government debt offset the economic benefits uh, from the climate investment. And this leads to a small drop in GDP. So in the end, it's important not to just to consider the climate proposals themselves, but the way that the federal government pays for these climate investments is just as important to determining their overall effects on our nation's economy. And one last thing I want to note is that our analysis is based on a static cost of carbon because that's, that's what the research has available. Uh, what this means is that we assume that the cost effectiveness of each of these provisions doesn't change over time, when in fact they may change significantly. Uh, in some cases, investments may become more valuable over time. So for example, investments in electric vehicles may become more valuable as companies become more efficient at manufacturing them and our grid shifts to more electricity generation from renewables. By contrast, investments in updating older buildings for improved energy efficiency may actually decline over time for exactly the same reason. As more energy comes from renewable sources, these investments abate less carbon over time. And so, uh, you know, a full analysis we'd like to be able to do someday would to be incorporate more dynamic effects as well. But, uh, you know, obviously we have to, we have to, you know, we're limited by the, the availability of the best research. Thanks, John. Uh, I'm going to come back to a few of the things you mentioned a little bit later on in the program. But uh, next, I want to go to Katrina. Uh, Katrina, your organization supports carbon pricing as a solution to climate change, and I was hoping you could kind of talk to the audience about how that would work and, and why you guys think that is the best path forward. Thanks, Ben. Uh, at the Climate Leadership Council, we work on a policy called the Baker Schultz Carbon Dividends Plan. It is a four-part framework, a carbon fee, a dividend that takes the net revenue and distributes it to American households, regulatory simplifications that the fee is driving emissions reductions and a border carbon adjustment. Um, and this policy design is really intentional, but let's sort of like take it piecemeal. So a carbon price is the most efficient, lowest cost way to cut emissions. It is also the fastest acting way to cut emissions that we have at our disposal. The price path that we suggest starting at $40 a ton, rising at 5% real each year is enough to cut emissions in half by 2035. So this is a really significant step towards addressing our, our emissions. Uh, necessary to, to addressing emissions at the scale and speed demanded, hard to conceive of um, a different sort of policy makeup that lets us realize that scale of emissions reductions at that pace. Um, the fee is placed on fossil fuels as they enter the economy. Um, as the Senator said, it's a um, relatively easy instrument to introduce and you sort of let the economy um, sort out how to preference lower carbon sources of energy, more efficient behaviors, deployment of things we already know how to do, and innovation for the technologies of the future. The dividend is important to address the progressivity of a climate solution, um, as the senator invoked. So we know that any um, any effort to address greenhouse gas emissions is going to have costs in the economy. We know those costs will be borne by households. It is really important to keep their experience in mind as we develop approaches to climate change. The introduction of the dividend ensures that more American households are better off financially while we're dealing with the climate change um, than if we don't. So American households will have more wealth because of the climate solution that we choose. Regulatory simplification ensures that we address the uncertainty, the unpredictability in the rules making process. And it gives the market a whole lot of clarity over, um, as the Senator said, like what they need to do to compete and to win. Um, that certainty is a really important part 
of ensuring the deployment and the innovation we need to address the climate challenge. Um, and then the border carbon adjustment I'll invoke again, it lets us consider this international dimension, our ability to link up um, with ambition in other countries, but also to hold emitters accountable no matter where they are. It is not a climate solution if we reduce American emissions and encourage the increase of emissions overseas, right? So you might think of emissions as a balloon and if we reduce what's happening in the US, we're gonna increase emissions abroad. Um, but the Senator invoked our carbon advantage work, which shows not just that we would shift emissions abroad, but that they would increase because economic activity overseas is much more carbon intensive than economic activity at home. Um, he also invoked the economist statement for carbon dividends. Um, I encourage you to look at our website to find it, clcouncil.org, the largest statement in the history of the economics profession, endorsing this four-part pathway to address climate emissions. Thanks, Ben. Thanks. Mark, I, I want to go to you next because you and your team recently put out an analysis on the effects of combining new climate spending with a carbon tax. So I was hoping you could tell us, what did you find there? That's exactly right. We wanted to look at what happens if you sort of both push and pull, right, on climate change. You include the investments like in Build Back Better along with a carbon tax. We listed a group called Energy Innovation that helped us do some of the modeling, so huge shout out to them. Um, when they just looked at the Build Back Better climate provisions in isolation, um, which as you know, would cost about $550 billion, they found it would reduce emissions relative to where they're headed about 17% in 2030. Not bad, but pretty far from where we need to get. We need to probably get to like 35% relative to where we're headed in order to be Paris, the low 30s. Um, it would also cost 550 billion, as John, John said, um, on its own probably weaken the economy in part because of that borrowing. Um, we then looked at sort of two types of carbon taxes. One was very similar to the one that Katrina mentioned, starting at $40, growing 5% a year. The other is smaller one starting at $20, growing 1% uh, a year. And we found that those would reduce emissions um, 14 to 21%. So basically somewhere in the middle will get you the equivalent of Build Back Better. Again, it depends on what year you look and your modeling, et cetera, um, and would raise a lot of money. Then we looked at, well, what happens if you put these two together? Basically, we found that a $20 carbon tax would be sufficient to fully pay for Build Back Better's provisions. And together, they would drive down emissions by about a quarter, which is pretty significant. The $40 carbon tax would have 5% growth. Um, would be enough to get emissions down 30% almost to the levels that we've committed to under the Paris Agreement, very close to them, uh, and would raise up nearly a trillion dollars in the process, which, of course, I would want to use for deficit reduction, but could be used for anything from uh, dividends to a tax cut to um, other kinds of spending, you, you name it. It's a lot of extra money to have available. So uh, obviously, you need to make sure that, that the left hand knows what the right hand is doing. And these, these provisions work together rather than against each other. But our analysis found this push-pull approach to be very helpful in reducing emissions in a, in a fiscally sustainable way. Thanks, Mark. I want to now kind of look at the, the U.S. economy as a whole. And when you think about our economy, so much of it is driven by uh, carbon-emitting activities. So my question uh, to you all is, do you think there is a trade-off, uh, you know, between supporting economic growth and addressing climate change? And, and if so, how do we manage this, given everything going on economically right now? Who you call on first? Uh, uh, well, I'll, I'll let you go first, Mark. <laughs> uh, I, I think in many ways, we have to, have to recognize there is some trade-off, um, whether it's through tax or through regulation. Um, when we switch over from some of the things that we are doing now, that's going to impose a cost to the economy. Um, the, the question is twofold. One is, how do we minimize that cost in the most efficient way? And part of that, I think, is by removing existing inefficiencies that we have and replacing them with more efficient ways. And the second is how do we um, sort of invest that short that short term cost into long term gains, because climate change itself is very harmful to the to the economy. And I do think a carbon tax um, is probably the most efficient, efficient approach in most of these areas, uh, as well as maybe some um, research um, in, in new kinds of technologies. Yeah, I, I don't think I uh, have too much to disagree with there. You know, when we, uh, the Penn Wharton budget model, think of investments in our environment, we think of them really like any other sort of government investments, uh, you know, like investments in public infrastructure, you know, a healthier environment provides benefits or for lack of a better word, services. Uh, these benefits and services are valuable. There are more productive arable land, higher productivity, fewer catastrophic weather events, more enjoyment of the outdoors, etc. 
So we shouldn't think of investment in the environment and our economy as mutually exclusive. There's nothing really about environmental investment that inherently leads to economic decline. Uh, that's not to say, however, that there aren't more efficient and less efficient investments in carbon abatement. Um, you know, these investments aren't really any different than any other sort of government program. Some have benefits that exceed the costs and others not so much. Um, in the case of the environment, uh, investments in natural resource management or wind electricity generation have historically yielded very high returns, um, you know, whereas uh, recent research indicates that investment in weatherization or electricity efficiency tend to be a little bit lower uh, returns. Um, you know, and this is the case with any type of government investment, investing in projects that yield the highest returns is going to yield the best economic outcomes. Smart investments lead to higher productivity in other sectors and greater services from the environment for each dollar they invest. Uh, the one last thing I'd like to mention, I sort of mentioned before, is that we don't treat that we don't see trade-offs between economic growth and environmental protection. That's not to say everyone benefits from the proposed policies. Uh, climate policies may positively affect certain groups to the detriment of others. And understanding who is affected and how they're affected can lead to a policy that will be more palatable to a greater share of our community. Uh, and, and I know that it sounds like Kat uh, Katrina is pushing a, 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 um, a dividend process that sort of looks to address those sorts of uh, inequities. I'll echo Mark and John's comments. Um, and I maybe want to introduce like an alternative frame. So um, any economic transition has cost to the economy, but as compared to what? Um, and I feel like for a long time, our consideration of the cost of climate proposals was versus the cost of doing nothing. And that is just not on the table. So what we're in a scenario where we need to figure out how to address the climate challenge with effective government instruments. And it is incumbent upon us in the policy and advocacy community to identify the least cost ways of addressing climate change. We know that there will be a solution set. We know that solution set is coming. It could be defined by the White House or it can be defined by Congress. Um, a bipartisan solution through a legislative frame is gonna be much more economically efficient than a series of regulations um, and rulemakings to drive down emissions. Um, we've done analysis of what we call like a price-based scenario, our domestic carbon fee with a dividend versus a regulatory and um, subsidy and sort of um, the bits and pieces that might come out from, from a White House plan to address climate emissions. Um, and if they achieve the same amount of emissions reductions over the same period, um, this an area where you use a price ensures a healthier economy of $200 billion more per year in GDP, healthier households, more expenditures from households than in a regulatory or, or subsidy-based scenario, and healthier industry, $120 billion more in economic productivity from heavy manufacturing. So we have to figure out what the least cost way is of addressing this challenge of climate change. Um, and, and you know we have the analysis to support using um, a market price uh, as the anchor of our climate solution. I mean, I just wanna jump in and add that the, the, the reason the carbon price is such an efficient way to do this compared to the alternatives is it basically lets the economy and the market decide what are the most efficient ways to reduce carbon, both within our existing technology set and especially if you have a carbon tax that's scheduled to go up over time substantially in the future through our investments in new kinds of technologies. And it's really hard, um, even with really good regulators, to get the same kind of result when, you, when you're doing it top down. Uh, I want to stick on the theme of the economy. And, you know, you can't discuss the economy without discussing the elephant in the room, inflation. Um, you know, we heard Senator Whitehouse talk about it. We know the consumer prices are up eight, uh, over 8% from the past year. Energy prices are up 30%. So I'm curious, you know, we've talked about a couple solutions, but what effect will all these climate policies have on, in, on inflation? Because I'm sure there are people thinking like, yes, we have a climate issue, but we have an inflation issue as well. So, um, you know, how do, we, how do we tackle both of these? And, and what effect will pursuing these climate policies have on on inflation and, and John, maybe I'll turn to you to kick this question off. Um, yes, <laughs> uh, I haven't thought, uh, you know, we haven't put a lot of thought into exactly how these climate, um, you know, policies intersect with inflation. I mean, one of the uh, facts you note there is that, you know, uh, the energy prices have increased significantly. So certainly if we increase taxes on them right now, we're going to be um, you know, causing, uh, you know, people who are the most intensive energy users, whether that be at a business or at a household level, uh, you know, they're, they're going to have to pay even more. Um, so, 
in, in some sense, the people who are already impacted by inflation are going to be in, in the short term impacted more by these types of policies. In the long term, however, I, I don't know that that's true as, as ener energy inflation, sorry, as energy prices hopefully normalize, um, you know, in a the, in the couple of years time. I can jump in unless Katrina, you want to go first. Oh, please. Um, so ordinarily, so a carbon tax is going to increase the price that you pay um, sort of at a first order effect. Ordinarily, that wouldn't be too big an issue because the Federal Reserve can offset it to some degree. It's going to be actually transitory, sort of a one-time level shift. And on its own, it would have some sort of downward um, push on, on demand. But this isn't ordinary times. We have extremely high inflation now. The Federal Reserve is behind the curve, so they can't really you know, raise interest rates more than they otherwise um, would. We're at very high risk of inflation being embedded. And so I do think we need to be extra careful, both in how we're doing the spending and how we're doing the, the, the taxes. On the spending, um, I think that you know these the, these types of subsidies, you know, for for EV cars, for example, that are going to push the market further past its its potential and have additional subsidies for higher wage payments, probably aren't appropriate um, for this time and at, um, at least not in the first couple of years. On the tax side, this might be a reason to start the carbon tax really low, like a dollar low, like just to prove that we can put an effect but have a schedule for it to go up in, in the future. Um, and if that schedule is, is credible, it could cause some investments now to reduce, potentially put downward pressure on the prices in the near term, knowing that the future price pressures are coming, but hopefully after we've gotten inflation under control. I'll just add, I'll just add one thing. Um, there's been a study of the um, relationship between enacting a carbon price and inflation in overseas markets. Um, and what they found was a mild deflationary impact when a carbon price was introduced. Huge blinking asterisks here. They were not studying the impact of a carbon price in high inflation scenarios like we're presently living in. But it is important to note one of the things that Mark mentioned, which is that it's gonna drive up increases for prices on fossil fuels, but that does not represent all of the energy and all of the resources used across the economy. Um, and that's part of what this this interesting finding reveals. Second thing I'll note, uh, climate policy has to be durable. If we are going to address a challenge like climate change, we need legislation that lasts um, and gaining political consensus around a, a climate change policy um, is gonna be really tough to achieve during present economic times. Um, it makes it all the more important that we do excellent analysis to provide policymakers for when they can start moving forward on this, on this priority. I just had one thing I wanted to add uh, as an addendum here. Um, although our analysis was on Build Back Better, I just wanted to speak to the, uh, the potential effects of the uh, carbon tax. Um, the carbon tax will obviously raise a fair amount of revenue. And to the extent that the debt, the government debt intersects with inflationary pressures, obviously having more revenue would, uh, would ameliorate that a bit. Uh, I don't know the extent to which that's the case currently, but I just wanted to mention that. Yeah, I think what you would see from a carbon tax, say you put on debt reduction, what you would see is sort of from the demand side, it would push down demand and help with, with you know, what you think of as GDP inflation. But from the consumer side, it would push up consumer inflation because of those prices. And in normal times, you wouldn't have to worry about that. But when there's a risk that people are going to really rebase their inflation expectations, you should worry. Uh, I want to look at I uh, want to go back, uh, Katrina, you began uh, this panel discussion talking about the balloon, right, with with carbon, where you decrease it here and you increase it there. And, you know, looking at it right now, 85 percent of carbon emissions are from outside the U.S. and the share is rising. So given that, you know, are the solutions we're talking about really going to move the needle or is there others that we should be looking at as well? Uh this is my sweet spot. And in February, um, we launched the Center for Climate and Trade uh, here at the council. And we did it to understand better how the international trading system can be a linkage point um, to climate ambition um, and um, joining forces with other like-minded countries to address climate change. Uh, the, as you say, 85% of emissions come not from the United States. Our only ability to address those emissions comes from international climate diplomacy and how we operate as a major consumer in the global economy. 
So I'm looking at that, that role that consumers can play in bending the curve on emissions internationally. But international trade can also be a really important lever for getting more good stuff out into the global economy. We wanna bend the curve here at home, but we also wanna reduce emissions overseas and we wanna build development pathways that are tied towards a low carbon um, energy system rather than taking for granted that development and carbonization have to go hand in hand. Um, and so this international trade angle gives us a new set of policy tools to use to think about how the market interacts with our decisions about carbon emissions. This is new. Um, we've been talking about a border adjustment as connected to a domestic carbon price for a long time. The European Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism proposal doing that, um, but there are other instruments that are related to international trade that the White House is presently exploring using right now. White House, um, Pennsylvania Avenue, not Senator White House. So um, in November of last year, the US renegotiated steel and aluminum tariffs with the European Union with a promise to work together to address the carbon intensity of these traded commodities. So the global arrangement for sustainable steel and aluminum is an agreement to agree on a framework to drive down the emissions associated with international trade in these products, specifically because of Chinese oversupply in that marketplace, which is putting more efficient firms in the US, in the European Union under financial pressure. Um, so we are exploring right now um, what additional tools we might use that help address that sort of balloon on international emissions. Um, but it seems like there's a really robust series of policies that we might be able to turn to. Thanks. Mark, uh, John, anything anything to add there? I mean, I'll just add that in, in addition to our role with diplomacy and, and our, our trade policy, um, new technologies that are invented here to reduce emissions can be adopted abroad. And so the kinds of um, incentives, both on the given put side that lead to the development of those new technologies can, can end up benefiting the world. Uh, we're gonna go to audience questions in a minute. And before we do, I just wanna, again, invite uh, those watching to submit a question using the Q&A feature at the bottom of our screen. If you have a question for a specific panelist, please make sure to, um, Note that when you submit. Uh, okay, we're 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 uh, about less than six months out from the midterms, and so uh, in that interview with with Maya, you did hear Senator Whitehouse talk about if there's a reconciliation bill, they have to get it done before uh, they leave for August recess. So I'm curious to get everyone's perspective, looking into your crystal ball. Uh, what do you view as the outlook, both both for Build Back Better? and policies like a carbon tax, either you know before the midterms or heading into the new Congress that'll be seated in January. Who wants to go first? Nobody, it sounds like. <laughs> I, I think we're gonna- I almost called Bueller. <laughs> and the debt outlook by the end of the year and everything's gonna be great. So I'm just gonna keep saying that to myself. Good. John, Katrina, anything to add? I'm afraid, uh, you know, we do a lot of studies on the on the policies as they're created, but we, you know, we don't uh, focus too much on on what the likelihood or or the uh, you know the the outcome is going to be once those policies are actually proposed. So, I wish I had more to share, but I really don't. I'm I'm not particularly bullish about um, build back better or a reconciliation process um, coming to fruition, but I I would say that if one does. Um, and we think something like a carbon price might be included in it, it is much more likely to be related to these border policies that the Senator invoked um, that we are studying at the Center for Climate and Trade. We know that there has been this sort of like bipartisan sidebar conversation series going on um, about policies that we might be able to use to address energy and climate issues. Um, and one of the sort of primary focus areas in that conversation series is a border carbon adjustment. So if um, the, the reconciliation package does come together, which again, I am not bullish about passage, um, I think anything that looks like a carbon price will be much more likely to be related to imported emissions rather than domestic emissions. Uh, 
Thank you. Uh, let's go to audience questions now. And I, I have uh, one question here from a gentleman named Bill who's watching and, and he says, you know, a lot of countries have massive debt loads le leaving COVID. So is there any country that we can look at who is handling both the fiscal side of the house and the climate side of the house really well? I thought that was an interesting question to kick us off. I, I have mean, no almost, insights, but I'm curious about the answer. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very good question. I wish I knew more. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll just say broadly, I think almost every country is doing better than than we are on their fiscal and their um, climate outlook. Not every country, but in the OECD, I mean, Europe is um, moving forward faster than we are on the climate side. And if you look at countries, you know, sort of their five year out debt measures, we're one of the few countries that um, still thinks our debt's going to be higher uh, five years than it is today. Uh, Mark, I'm going to go. Next question uh, is to you. And can you talk about more about uh, carbon tax and the debt and what effect that would have and diving a little bit deeper there in terms of if we instituted a carbon tax, what, what do you see the effect being on our national debt and fiscal outlook? Sure. So like that's, that's the $2 trillion question, right? Um, so assuming that we could get a carbon tax into effect, depending on what it looks like, um, it's, it's gonna raise anywhere from, you know, a few hundred billion to a couple trillion dollars over a decade. That's, that's pretty significant. I mean, that's, a, that's enough to reduce our, our debt to GDP, 7% of GDP or so if you did the whole thing. Uh, realistically, it's probably going to go to a variety of, of, um, of places. I mean, you could use it to, for carbon dividends, you could use it to pay for build back. Um, better new climate investments. You could use it for transition costs to, to lower taxes. Um, whatever's left for deficit reduction after that, my guess is it's gonna be more modest, um, but still directionally helpful. Um, anything we can do to even improve the debt a little bit, I think would be a step in the right direction because it's a, we're in a pretty unsustainable path. I'd like to add in our, in our uh, you know, dynamic overlapping generations model, sort of the workhouse of, of our fiscal analysis, uh, there are sort of two things going on with the carbon tax. Typically, we, we usually think about it mostly as a, as a consumption tax. And in these sorts of models, consumption tax, although the benefits may not be uh, distributed evenly, they, then, they tend to be pro-growth. And, and the reason for that is that they uh, incentivize savings over consumption. So the people tend to save more and invest more, and that leads to additional growth. On the second part of this is the, the reduction in debt. Uh, the reduction in debt actually what, what we call crowds in investments so the government is not borrowing uh in in exchange some of the money that would have gone to government debt is now going to go to private investment i mean there are international capital flows as well but we assume that some of the money is going to go to private investment which will also lead to more investment more savings and greater economic output over the long run uh Thank you. Uh, Ray writes in, uh, will the carbon dividend be sufficient to offset the rise in the cost to individual households? And if so, how will it be administered? I'll, I'll start with that one. Um, so uh, how will it be administered? We actually learned a lot of lessons um, during the COVID response about how to structure something like a, a distribution to households. Um, and so, uh, to learn more about that, um, we have a paper on our website, um, again, clcouncil.org. Um, the, um, the impact of the dividend to households. Um, based on our analysis, the average household in the first eight income deciles comes out ahead. That's a fancy way of saying um, that lower earning American households stand to benefit the most from a carbon dividends framework. Indeed, we'll have more revenue to spend on average um, than if there was no carbon dividends framework. And so we're taking a climate response and ensuring a sort of um, progressive result. Um, and this is because lower income households spend a greater percentage of their income on energy and energy services, on energy intensive goods, but a much lower amount than wealthier households. And so an equal dividend distributed on a per capita basis ensures that those lower income households come out most ahead. So the majority of American households will be better off with carbon dividends than without it, but there will be some households where it doesn't cover costs. Um, so if you have a, a second home and you get there with a private jet, you are unlikely to have your carbon footprint offset by a dividend program. Unless it's an electric powered private jet. 
unless it's an electric powered private jet. And then it depends where you get your electricity, I assume. Uh, uh, John, Mark, anything to, to add to that? Okay, we have uh, Mary who writes in about, in the interview we heard with Senator Whitehouse, he was quick to correct Maya when she said it was a carbon tax. He calls it a carbon fee. Uh, Katrina, you refer to it as carbon pricing. So um, someone writes in, can you help me make sense of all three? Or are we just talking about the same thing? Uh, my great grandmother used to say, call me whatever you want, just don't call me late for dinner. Um, these, are, <laughs> these are all describing the same thing. Um, I, I think that the word tax is tough for some people. Um, the word fee may be tough for some people, but these are, these are all different ways of describing the same kind of policy. Uh, Peter writes in, can the U.S. impose a carbon, excuse me, can the U.S. impose carbon border adjustments without a federal carbon price? It's a great question. Um, it is my take that it is easiest to introduce a border adjustment if we have a domestic carbon price. You need to understand two things to do a border adjustment. Um, one, how much carbon is coming in and two, how much it should cost. Um, and so a domestic carbon price resolves the second part of that equation quite elegantly. We're seeing a lot of um, a lot of interest in a border adjustment that starts even before a domestic carbon price. And I think it's really interesting because um, being able to address imported emissions would allow the US to have a, a, sub, a substantial impact on our own uh, emissions footprint, but also global emissions. Um, so if the U.S. were able to import goods that are as carbon intensive as our own, we would cut domestic emissions 600 million tons. 75% of our imports come from much more carbon intensive jurisdictions. So lowering the footprint of those imports will be important. Um, and we open up the possibility of cooperating with countries that are like-minded, the European Union, um, Canada, UK, Japan, also exploring these border tools. If all of us are able to get our imports carbon intensity down to our domestic carbon intensity, we'll cut almost 6% of total global emissions. So this is a really powerful tool to have in the toolkit. And I think it's important to think about developing it even as we're trying to determine what our domestic climate strategy should be. Uh John, Mark, I want to direct this next question to you. It's from Deborah, who says, do you see, do you foresee a permanent set of financial indicators that can concurrently measure the, val the value of new balanced climate uh, policies results uh, that also establish sustainable economic growth? I'm going to kick that to you, John, because you guys have the model. Yeah. Um... Not, you know, we, we really aren't looking uh, at those again. So, sorry, the, can, you, can you repeat the question one more time? Yeah, do we, um, do you foresee a set of financial indicators that are developed that look at how effective a climate or a social policy might be while also looking at its effect on economic growth? Um, I think if you're using uh, just a, a cost benefit analysis, it should encompass most of those features. Uh, you know, it should be getting most of the, you know, if you're measuring the sides correctly, if you're measuring the benefits correctly and the cost correctly, you should, you should capture all those features in the analysis itself. Um, there are a few little caveats to that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, overall, I think that's, that's the trick. It's just be, just being very mindful about your individual policy and making sure that you get everything on the cost and the benefit side, uh, you know, you, you should get most of that, most of your question answered there, I would think. I, I think one challenge is some things are very easy to measure, uh, emissions levels, GDP output. That's right. Other things are very difficult to measure, um, efficiency gains or losses in, in sort of consumer producer surplus, for example. Um, there's still a big debate on what is the social cost of carbon? You can't, can't actually know it, right? We make an estimate. Um, and, it, and what is the appropriate discount rate? How much should we weigh the future versus the present, especially if there's something that's potentially either an existential threat or um, you know, to some subset of the population um, or to some economies. So I don't know if we're ever gonna have 
perfect ways of measuring any of this, but I think we no, have- that's to right. I mean, and, and some of the benefit here, as you mentioned, between what you just said and, and the, the, the sinking boat uh, analogy is that, you know, some of this is insurance. The value is in insurance. Like we're protecting against the very worst outcome. Um, and to the extent that you're not going to see the, the value in that, unless it, you know, it, it's going to be very, very hard to imagine because if you avoid it, well, you're never going to know what it was. Um, so it's, it's going to be very difficult to measure some of these things accurately. I think that's right. Uh, uh, thanks, John. Uh, Fred writes in, uh, you know, when we're talking about a, a, about carbon pricing, there's a tone problem. He says an underlying presumption that carbon pricing is some kind of an overall burden. Isn't it more of an impetus towards and a reward for transition? Isn't that what we should be focusing on? Katrina, I'll, I'll turn to you first for, for that question. I, I so appreciate that frame, right? It comes back to this question of like, of compared to what? Um, so are we, um, are we doing a carbon price as an alternative to doing absolutely nothing to address climate change? Or are we enacting a carbon price as an alternative pathway to addressing climate change that is more efficient, more effective, um, that helps American households come out further ahead? Um, and not to beat a dead horse, but it also enables us to think of that border adjustment, which indeed um, pairing a domestic carbon fee and a border adjustment helps American industry be more competitive. So we've done analysis that shows that a carbon fee and a border adjustment will help increase the sales and profitability from the domestic steel industry, especially against foreign more carbon intensive imports. So a carbon fee is also a vehicle for improving the competitive position even of incumbent firms. It is a really powerful toolkit that we can use, a tool in the toolkit that we can use. Um, and it is certainly an opportunity for US industry to be more competitive because US industry is already more carbon efficient and wants to know what that firm signal is into the future to improve their carbon efficiency, to make investments, to be competitive while addressing climate change. Yeah, I, I really like to think of these programs as investments and, you know, in the same way that building a bridge is an investment, it costs money on one side, you know, there's some sort of social, there's, there's a resource cost to doing this. Uh, but on the other side, you're getting a stream of services, you're getting some benefit out of it over time and, you know, measured uh, in the ways I've, I've talked about before. Um, and so, you know, focusing on the word, maybe focusing on the word tax or fee makes it sound like it's, uh, it's a negative, but, you know, we have to consider all of the components together uh, in order to, uh, you know, really evaluate the value of the proposal. Uh, Michael writes in, what is the mechanism for making, um, you know, a, a carbon tax work? Why can't businesses like a utility simply add these costs to their rate base and raise prices to cover the additional costs? It's a really great question. And the answer is competition. Uh, and so we, we are operating in, in a U.S. economy, especially where we have a whole lot of choice about where our energy and energy services come from. We have lower carbon alternatives, right? Um, the Senator invoked the coal to gas switch that has lowered the emissions from the electricity sector so profoundly in the United States. We have alternative source of electricity um, that is even just, just coal to gas. And now think of opportunities to move from coal to something like solar or wind power. Um, we have choice. Uh, we also have the potential to invest in things like efficiency or process change that allows us to reduce the emit, emitting, um, excuse me, allows us to reduce emissions um, while achieving the same sort of outcome that we want to. A price unlocks efficiency investments, unlocks process changes that will allow us to create the same value with much fewer emissions. So competition, innovation, that's why a carbon fee works. The marketplace is always looking for what that competitive edge is that they can hold over their competitors in a field. Carbon price gives the opportunity to find a competitive edge by lowering emissions. I, I'll add, I think that um, this is a really important question and should make us think a little bit about the timing of the policy. When we did our analysis, there's something called elasticity, basically how much um, is dollar increase in carbon prices gonna reduce your carbon emissions? And when we did this modeling, um, with energy innovation, what we found is that for the power sector, they can substitute quite quickly and aggressively. Um, so you can really drive it down. With the transportation sector, it takes a lot more time, right? Because I, I buy a car today, I'm probably going to hold on to it for 20 years. And if the price goes up, I might drive a little bit less, but I still have to go to work for the two days a week that Ben's making me go into the office. 
Um, and housing um, you know, efficiency is even slower than that. So we may want to think about what's the appropriate timing of the, car of the carbon tax, what's the appropriate phase in um, that we're maximizing the substitution while minimizing the, you know, just the, the price burden. Yeah, can I just add one thing? Um, so if we're going to invoke a term like elasticity, um, a really interesting trend in the literature is that we might be dramatically misestimating the price responsiveness or the elasticity in the transportation sector, because all of our models are built around sort of episodic changes in the price of transportation fuels as a result of global supply chains and constraints. Um, a price-based intervention, uh, like a carbon price, is going to create a much more stable and predictable response that might actually encourage the transportation sector to respond more than we anticipate it will. So I will just note um, that our ability to gauge the elasticity of response in these various sectors is related to what we know of looking back, um, which is not necessarily predictive of going, going ahead in, in a carbon price scenario. Uh, thank you. Uh, and also, Mark, thank you for that shout out about coming into the office uh, <laughs> two days a week. Uh, real quickly, Anne writes in about uh, if we can post some of the research that's being discussed uh, uh, during this event. We'll include that in our wrap up materials, which you'll uh, most likely get probably tomorrow or Thursday. Uh, next question I want to go to comes from Jordan, uh, who writes in. Um, could cap and trade carbon pricing programs have unattended consequences on communities that have been historically marginalized? And how do we address those inequities with pollution allocation? Katrina. Okay, sorry, you were nodding, so I wanted, I wanted to let you go. Um, yeah, there. Are, it's important to be mindful of what the consequences of different decarbonization policies will be. Um, a carbon price will have some consequences, as will a regulatory scenario, uh, a series of mandates, a series of subsidies. So every pathway is going to have consequences. It's important to be mindful of what those are. It is important to select decarbonization pathways that are least likely to have negative unintended consequences. That's why the efficiency of a price is really important. Um, we've done research to look at what happens to um, uh, criteria pollutants, a, a basket of pollutants that have acute impacts on human health um, if we have a carbon price. So while we're reducing um, domestic carbon emissions 50% by 2035, our policy is also cutting these co-pollutants 20 to 50% by 2035. That's on a national level. The sort of um, the local and the regional impacts of a carbon price will be unequal, right? The market price allows us to decarbonize at uneven speeds in different sectors and areas. Um, and so it is really important to be mindful of the other instruments we have to address, for example, local pollution issues related to um, diesel traffic from, from major economic activity or an individual facility. And so the other instruments to improve environmental outcomes on a local basis are a necessary companion to any decarbonization strategy, including a carbon fee. And, and just to, to flag a bit of what Katrina is saying, um, we need to be considerate of the, the cost burden um, by, by population, by income, by race, by geography, but also the cost of ongoing increases in, in global temperatures and what, what that can mean based on, on those same sets of criteria. Uh, John, next question is for you. And uh, the viewer writes in that, you know, we spent a lot of this event talking about carbon pricing. Uh, when you looked at uh, the policies in Build Back Better, were there any that you think are worth highlighting that maybe we haven't discussed or that aren't getting enough attention in the debate? Um, I mean, the, the most interesting policy in the Build Back Better, I think, is the electric vehicle subsidies. And, and there are several reasons that it's interesting. Uh, the first is for reasons, I think, that, uh, that right now they can't seem to build enough electric vehicles right this moment. And so if the goal of your policy is to induce change, behavioral change, by having people invest more, if we're completely stuck by these, by these artificial supply constraints, you know, you're not going to be successful in changing behavior in the short run. So that's one interesting thing. Now that changes over the long run. The other thing that I find very interesting about EV policy is there's a lot of interesting research and in how the benefits are very geographically different. So for example, if you 
encourage somebody to buy an electric vehicle in North Dakota, you're actually going to increase carbon emissions because the marginal electricity in North Dakota comes from coal. But if you take that same subsidy and apply it to say Texas or California, it's gonna have a very positive effect on in emissions for exactly the opposite reason, because a lot of their marginal electricity is solar and, and, um, uh, and wind. And, and so, you know, looking at policies like that, it's tough to distill them down into a single, a single value. Um, so I, I just found that, that particular aspect of Build Back Better particularly interesting because there are a lot of different dimensions on it. Uh, I mean, some of the other ones that are, that are, that are interesting are, you know, the, there are some very inexpensive ones for like soil and agricultural management that I think get overlooked a lot uh, that tend to be among the higher efficiency uh, gains when you're spending money uh, to, to abate carbon. But uh, yeah, I think those are probably the most interesting ones that I saw in BBB. Uh, John, I have to tell you, you hit a personal note there for me. My wife and I just bought our first uh, hybrid car about a year ago, and we had to buy it sight unseen and then wait for three months to, to get it. So, Congratulations. Uh, I hope it worked out. It, it, it did. Uh, she, she loves it, and I'm, I'm still driving our 09 Honda Accord. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm on a waiting list for a plug-in hybrid. Maybe October. We'll see. <laughs> um, going, uh, Deborah writes in, are there any projections as to what an individual or family can achieve when it comes to carbon reductions uh, in a new sustainable world? I'm not sure I, I understand um, exactly what the, what the question is, but um, no one individual can change the, the dynamics of the overall um, emission standard, but there, there are things we can do collectively even without public policy, right? Um, um, that, that can move the needle. Uh, I think my sense is, and I assume John and Katrina agree, that big changes are gonna require, um, are gonna require legislation, regulation, are gonna require public policy. Yeah, I, I'll just, I'll echo Mark. Um, yeah, individual households can reduce their carbon footprint. Um, they can make investment decisions like improving insulation or installing those windows that have like the noble gas insulation between panes. Um, there's a lot of things that individual households can do. Climate change is a market failure. Policies to address the market failure are going to be necessary for us to impact the global trajectory of greenhouse gases. Well, I, this is a great segue when you talk about what you can do and uh, the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget does have uh, an ability for you. Uh, if you found this discussion fascinating and want to urge your policymaker to um, support a car carbon tax to fight climate change and our, our rising debt, I'm going to put uh, some info in the chat about how you can get involved, um, how you can get involved in what you can do to talk to uh, your current member of Congress. Uh, okay, I want to begin to to wrap it up, and I want to kind of um, start with. I think I want to I want to end with where we began, which is right fiscal policy and climate change. And one of the things that I, you know, I, one of the reasons I found this discussion so fascinating was because, you know, you often don't hear the two together in the same sentence. Okay. So, you know, as we move forward with this, I mean, I'm curious, um, what is the message you want to leave our viewers with today? Because for a lot of our viewers, we got a lot of questions about what is a carbon tax or how it works or, you know, what's going on with Build Back Better or simply what can they do? Um, the, the response for information we've gotten in the chat has been amazing. So uh, I'd like each of you to just reflect for a minute or two about moving forward, what would be your final message to those tuning in today? And um, uh, who wants to go first? John, I'll just go say ahead. something really quickly here. Um, you know, I, I think the one message that I want to, to emphasize is that, you know, is that Build Back Better is an, actually an agglomeration of many smaller policies, and they all need to be thought of separately because they're very different policies. Uh, and, and that goes for the carbon tax, too. Uh, you know, is that climate, you know, you can try to cl uh, combat climate change through legislation, but, uh, you know, you probably want to take a look at it, it, all the, the proposals are not created equal um, and that some are definitely much more cost efficient uh, and economically efficient uh, 
um, um, and, and, and palatable to larger groups across our community uh, than, than, uh, than others, and, and that you should look at each individual constituent, not just the entire policy itself. I'll go. Um, so first, I just want to thank you for sharing time today for having me on this panel. This was a really fun conversation, and I learned a lot. Um, but my, I guess, number one takeaway for the audience, other than my gratitude, is uh, there's no silver bullet to address climate change. There is no one policy that's going to, you know, do the part for America on reducing our emissions. It's going to end up being a suite of policy choices that we make. Some of them at the same time, some of them, you know, in one big package. Um, but inevitably, we will be enacting climate policies uh, for the foreseeable future and likely beyond. It is really important to keep in mind the fiscal ramifications of these policies to balance wisely government expenditures um, and alternative tools that we might rely on. A carbon price is the single most effective instrument to address climate emissions in the United States, and it is an indispensable part of the toolbox, both because we want to address climate change meaningfully and because of the fiscal implications of climate policy. Uh, so we've got to keep uh, in mind that a carbon price belongs at the center of our response to climate change. Yeah, I, I want to... Um you know, share that thanks to everyone for tuning in and to Ben for moderating and John and Katrina for being here. Um, I wanna go back to something that, that, that Maya and Senator Whitehouse uh, talked about, which is that both climate change and, and sort of our fiscal outlook, they, they have a lot in common. They're both long-term threats that accumulate over time, but can um, hit a dangerous tipping point. And neither of them are easy to solve. They both require us making some kind of sacrifices or adjustments today. Um, the carbon tax offers this unique opportunity to sort of get a two for one. Um, to help pay for the new climate investments we do make to help reduce deficit or otherwise um, send people um, cash and to itself reduce emissions. And so, so um, whether it's a fee or a tax or a price, that's, that's why I find it so, so appealing and hope that, it, that it's in our policy toolbox. On that note, uh, let me thank you, Mark, John, Katrina. Um, just uh, so everyone knows, we'll be sending out a recording of this event uh, later on this week. Please, if you enjoyed it, share it on Facebook, on Twitter. Please send it to your friends and family. We'd love to have them join us at a future event. We'll also include some of the research that was discussed here. And again, we also want to thank Senator Whitehouse and his team for, for helping to arrange today's event. On behalf of everyone at the committee and everyone on the panel, thank you for joining us. And until our next event, take care. Goodbye, everybody.